نجلو استا ان شاء الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وإمام المتقين وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما وقال سبحانه وتعالى وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين وقال سبحانه وتعالى لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من صلى علي صلاة واحدة صلى الله عليه أشرا أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب زدنا علما بالقرآن العظيم وبسنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الحمد لله Today is the 132nd lesson of Al-Adab Al-Mufrad Alhamdulillah, Thumma Alhamdulillah, Thumma Alhamdulillah Despite so many times of disobeying Allah Despite so many times of going against the commands of Allah Week after week for the last 131 consecutive Fridays now So it's been over two and a half years Every single Friday Allah has allowed us to sit, Allah has allowed me, He has given me the ability, the tawfiq, where I can sit and be blessed and very fortunate to recite the sayings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. From this a person really understands that nothing is from my side, no effort, no capability is from my side. Allah ta'ala, when He wants goodness for a person, that is when Allah allows a person to come towards goodness. It's a very beautiful hadith, a hadith that I always like to say, to remind myself, to remind those that listen. And this hadith really makes you realize the value of gatherings wherein a person is sitting and the words of Allah, the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa being mentioned. This hadith is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. The narrator is Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu who narrates from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who says that when there is a gathering of people, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has some angels. Allah has created so many thousands of angels, and from them thousands of angels, there is one group of angels, that their sole purpose of existence is to roam the earth. They have been created just to roam the earth. Roam the earth for what? They have been created to roam the earth and find such places, such gatherings where people have gathered to remember Allah. That's their whole purpose. Allah created them for nothing more. That they will wander the streets of the world and they will look for places where people have gathered and they have gathered not for any worldly gain, not for any other reason, just to remember Allah, just to connect back to Allah. So then they find these places. When these angels find these places, then some gather and they start to surround the place. And then these angels, they say to the rest of the angels that are scattered around the streets and around the area, they say to them, Halummu ila hajatikum. Come, rush, halummu. Quickly come, come. Come towards your purpose. Come towards the purpose of your creation. That you have been created for this, come towards this. So these angels, they rush and they find a place where people have gathered. In Oldham, 8 o'clock, started Hadith class. In Westwood Hall, people have sat. No other motive. There's no food being distributed. There's no money being given out. There's no potential benefit of anyone. They have gathered because they know it's a Hadith class. It happens every Friday. They talk about the Prophet ﷺ. That's why. 
So these angels gather, and in the hadith it mentions that they surround their wings in, in, to, in this gathering. That they put their wings around this gathering to the extent that they reach towards the heavens. They all pile, 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 pile. They all come towards this. They found a place. So when they are piling, piling, so it's happening with every gathering that's taking place, where the name of Allah, the name of Rasulullah is being mentioned. So when they reach the heavens, Allah who's the all-knowing, Wallahu A'lam, Allah knows everything. Even then, He wants to have a conversation with these angels. So Allah says to His angels, Ya Malaika, Kayfa yakulu al-ibad? What is it? What are my servants doing? What are they saying? Why have they sat here? So the angels reply, Oh Allah, Friday, Hadith class, they've sat here just to t- listen about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa just to hear about you. That's, that's all. That's all they knew. Those that are newcomers, all they knew was, oh, it's a Friday Hadith class. He talks about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa They mention one or two stories. They mention one or two Hadith. That's all it is. So they've come. So Allah asks, is, is that why they've come? To remember me, to talk about me, to talk about my beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the angels say, yeah, that's why they've come. So Allah, despite knowing everything, Allah says to his angels, Hal ra'awni. Do you know these servants that have gathered, have they seen me? That they're praising me, they're talking about me, they're referring to Allah, Allah, Allah. Have they ever seen me? La wallahi ya rabbi. Oh Allah, they haven't seen you. They've never seen you. And Allah says, they still worship me. They still want to remember me. They haven't seen me and they still want to remember. They still want to talk to me. They still want to ask from me. So the angel says, yes, oh Allah. Allah says, why if they did see me? What would be different if they actually saw me? So the angels say, oh Allah, if they actually did see you, they would increase in their worship. Not one moment of their life would pass, but they would be there striving to please you, striving to remember you. Allah continues with the conversation. Okay, they've gathered, fair enough. So the objective of gathering, I want to be successful, you want to be successful. Allah's melted, melted my heart, your heart, so that we can learn about Allah and His Rasul. <coughs> so Allah asks the angels, that, what is it? What do they want from me? Ma yas'alunani. What are they asking from me? So the angels say, Ya Rabbi, yas'alunaka al-jannah. All they want from you is jannah. And what's another meaning of jannah? The pleasure of Allah. They just want you, for you to be happy with them. That's all they want. So Allah says, Hal rauha, have they seen this jannah? That they're talking about, they want jannah, they want this jannah. So the angels say, no, they haven't seen Jannah. They've just heard about it. Your Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned it to them. In the Quran, your book, you mentioned the scenes of Jannah. They can only just about understand a bit of Jannah. They can't understand it completely because Rasul says that Jannah is such a place no eye has ever seen. No heart can ever comprehend. No mind can ever comprehend. So they can't fully understand it, but they still want this Jannah. Because they know that's where your happiness lies. They haven't seen it? No, they haven't seen it. So now Allah says to the angels, okay, they want Jannah, but is there anything that they're scared of? Is there anything that they want to stay away from? So the angels say, yes, O oh Allah, min nar They don't want to go to the fire of hell. Deep down, every Muslim, I don't want to burn in the fire of hell. Even for a few minutes, even for a few hours, even for a few years, just for missing one salah, no one wants to burn in the fire of hell. I don't want to burn in the fire of hell. So the angels say, they don't want to burn. They don't want to be punished by you. They don't want it that you're upset with them. Allah says, have they seen this fire that they're so scared of? The angels say, La Allah, Ya Rabbi. No, they haven't seen it. They haven't seen this fire. Allah says, still, still they are scared. They are asking refuge from this fire. So now Allah he wants to conclude this conversation with these angels. So Allah says to the angels, Inni ushidukum. O oh my angels, I make you witness. And Allah Ta'ala is not in need of making anyone witness. Me and you, if we were to present ourselves to the court, you need witnesses to back your statement. You need witnesses to support you, to hear your claim, to hear what you've got to say. Allah Ta'ala doesn't need to. He still says to all of His angels, Inni ushidukum. O oh my angels, I make you all witness. Anni ghafartu lahum. I have forgiven every single person in that gathering. I've forgiven them just because they came and sat in a gathering where Allah and His Rasul are being mentioned. We haven't even started the class, we haven't even started the lesson. 
just on the arrival and on the gathering, this is the conversation being taken place with Allah and His angels. Allah has forgiven everyone that's gathered. So if it's a gathering of 50, gathering of 5, gathering of 2 people, still that same blessing, that same conversation happens for every gathering. So we should never be disheartened with whatever gathering we're in. If it's a gathering of 5 people, 50 people, Alhamdulillah. This conversation is happening. I have full belief in my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and in this hadith that has been transmitted by Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi. That this is the scenario happening with Allah Ta'ala. It's still not over. قَالَ الْمَلَكٌ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ One angel speaks out to Allah. From all them thousands of angels that have gathered and they've all piled up, one speaks to Allah. يَا رَبِّي فِيهِمْ فُلَانٌ فَلَيْسَ مِنْهُمْ there is one person in this gathering. So this announcement is made for every gathering. That there is one person in this gathering. فَلَيْسَ مِنْهُمْ He's not from amongst them. He did not come for the gathering. He didn't come for Hadith class. He didn't come just to listen to a bayan, just to listen to a speech. Someone told him to come. Someone said that, come and join in. Someone said that, you know what, it's a gathering taking place, you might as well come with me. He's come for a different motive, for a different reason. That after the gathering, I need to meet a friend. Or I've only come because after the gathering, I need to go somewhere with someone. He just told me to come. I didn't have free intention to come. So the angel says, Oh Allah, there's that kind of person here sitting here too. You've said you've forgiven everyone. How can you forgive him? He didn't come for the right reason. So listen to what Allah says. Ya Rabbi, Ya Allah. Allah says, that Such is this gathering. Humul Julasa. Such is this gathering. That no one is deprived, even that person who didn't come for the right intention. I, all, I make you, oh my angels, all of you witness, I also forgive that person. I forgive him too. That's just on a gathering. Where you're talking about Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's all it took for the mercy of Allah to start showering upon us. That Allah is saying that minus sins, minus sins, forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. So the way I see it is, throughout the whole week, so many times disobeying Allah, here and there. So many times. Despite disobeying Allah, so many times. Every Friday Allah has given the ability, that tawfiq, where we can gather. Wallahi azim. If there is any far, if there is any word that can ever show appreciation to such a Lord, to such a creator, that despite you disobeying Him so many times over, He still calls you, He still allows you to sit. And allows that your tongue, no matter how dirty it is, that you can still say, Qala Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi sallam, that no matter how evil our ears are, that we spend our time disobeying Allah, listening to haram, doing haram, despite all that, still the words of Allah and His Rasul still go inside our ears. It should have been the case that first time I disobeyed Allah, that this tongue became rotten, that these ears became deaf. But despite everything, every wrong, so what's the message from Allah from this? Simple message, oh my servant, I still want you to come back to me. I still want you to be mine. If you are breathing, if you are allowed to hear the name of Allah, if you can say the name of Allah, then wallahi lazim, that is enough to say that Allah still wants you to turn to Him. Allah still wants you to t- turn back and change your life. Allah still wants you to repent, still wants you to change your way. And this is the mercy of Allah. So never, never ever look at a gathering, whichever gathering, wherever you are. Don't look at it as a small thing. If you've gone, I'm telling you, it's not a coincidence. It's not that you've just appeared to come. Wallahi lazim, this is a call from Allah. That my servant, if you've come to listen to Quran, Hadith, to listen to good words about me, about my Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, then that's a sign, that's tawfiq, that's ability to do good. That's Allah saying to me and you, listen and take it in. And if the speaker says something for himself, for you all, and if it's for you, then you need to take that and know that this is a message from Allah. You see, sometimes you're in a gathering and you're sitting and all of a sudden the speaker says something and you think, Ya Allah, he's speaking to me. He must be speaking to me. That's not the miracle or the effort of that speaker. It's not him. The ulama explained that when, you're, when the speaker is speaking, he could be the worst of all of people. 
He could be the sinner compared to the rest of the audience. He could be the worst in the sight of Allah. But because he's on that position where he's speaking, Allah Ta'ala, he does not allow that those that have come with true talab, with true seeking, that they want Allah, they want to change. Allah does not allow that speaker, but that he has to say something for them. So to, to the extent that sometimes you plan a bayan, you plan a speech that today I'm going to speak about this, this is the hadith, I'm going to mention this story, I'm going to mention this hadith, and you go on, go on, and all of a sudden you go off on a tangent, that you just say something separate. That is not from the speaker, that's Allah saying that there is a servant of mine sitting here, he needs to hear this, so for him you have to say this. This tongue becomes in control by Allah, that he inspires that you have to say this for this servant of mine. He has come to listen to this point. This is what he needed from me. So if you ever have that situation, you feel this, Wallahi Razim, it's from Allah. That Allah is speaking to his servants. He wants me and you to turn back to him. The only question is, why am I not turning back? Why am I not, even though Allah is giving me opportunity after opportunity, why do I still waste it? If a person was to favor me in this world, and he gives me favor after favor, and after every favor, I do him over, I do wrong to him, I betray him, I deceive him. And despite that, he still continues to give, to give. Would you not say that this person is the greatest being that you've seen in your life? The best person to you, that you do so much wrong to him and he still gives. And my life and your life is such that in our life, so many times over we disobey Allah. Despite all the disobedience, disobediences, Allah still gives. Allah still allows me and you to come towards good. There is no greater creator. There is no creator but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Such a merciful creator. We should all say Alhamdulillah in our hearts to Allah. Ya Allah. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Last week we spoke about Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. That she is the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We spoke how Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam gave salam to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. This week Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi wants to mention that sometimes you receive a letter or a text message, a WhatsApp message, and it's not just a forwarded message. It's actually a message where someone has texted you privately and they're speaking to you and they're asking for a favor or they just want to speak to you. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi wants to say that if a letter reaches you, then in this hadith, this uh, athar, this author of Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, a statement of Ibn Abbas, the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Imam Bukhari wants to say to me and you, the way when someone gives salam to you and you should reply saying, wa alaykum as salam, in that same way if someone writes to you and it's such a letter where a reply or question is being asked, a reply is hoped for, then you should be replying, you should be replying. You see, our lives have become so busy that on WhatsApp, we forward everything, we forward every message, we you know, send one message to 15 groups, and we forward everything that sometimes, you know, you don't even read the correct uh, messages that you're meant to read. Sometimes someone has genuinely messaged you, texted you, you need to reply. Sometimes on WhatsApp especially, when the blue text come up, come up you know that a person somehow has seen it, and then you feel like, Yalla, why is he not replying to my text for? I messaged him three hours ago, he still hasn't replied. Maybe he's busy, maybe he just glanced at it. Or it's may, maybe it's possible that when he swiped his phone, the message opened up, he pressed exit and he, was, he continued with his work and he forgot that someone messaged. See, WhatsApp doesn't know that. They don't know that uh, it's possible that a person's not actually looking at his phone when the two ticks come up. But when you do receive a message and if it's important and it's in need of a reply, we should be replying. This is an etiquette of a Muslim. How? We will explain. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi says, وَبِهِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا عَلِيٌّ بِنْ حَجَّنَ قَالَ حَدَّ قَالَ أَخْبَرَنَا شَرِيكَ أَنِ الْعَبَّاسِ مِنْ ذَرِيعًا عَامِرَ أَنْ إِبْنِ عَبَّاسِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَى عَنْهُمَا قَالْ إِنِّي لَأَرَى لِجَوَابِ الْكِتَابِ حَقًّا كَرَدِّ السَّلَامِ Ibn Abbas رضي الله تعالى عنه says that indeed I see that to reply to a letter, it is important, it is a right that a person possesses the way it is important and it is the right of a believer, the right of a person that you reply to his salam. The way we say that it is important, very important, that you reply to the salam of a believer. If he says assalamu alaikum to, to you, you should say wa alaikum salam. Ibn, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu takes it one step further and says, <coughs> if someone writes to you and that letter, that message is in need of a reply, then when you have time, make sure you reply. When you have checked your phone properly, you have checked that message, and it's in need, don't just ignore it, do reply. 
is very important. So this is something that Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi is teaching me and you and the importance of a thing. You see this book, Al-Adab al-Mufrid, there's 1,300 ahadith approximately, and it's only focused on these parts of our life. It's not emphasizing on salah right now. We're not talking about zakat. We're not talking about Ramadan. We're talking about what it means to be a Muslim in our day-to-day life. And if I'm being very honest with you, I'm being very blunt, I'm very honest with you. We have the worst of all of misconceptions. Wallahi lazim, our understanding of deen, Islam, is very, very weak. Why? We think piety is when a person is dressed with a jubba, he's wearing an amama, he's using the miswak, and his appearance shows to him to be the most closest to Allah. We think just this part of my life is Islam. This is a very small part of Islam. Very small part. In what respect? In respect of everything else in our life. You see, when we think about deen and Islam, we think changes means that I'm going to start praying salah, I'm going to start fasting the month of Ramadan, I might change my appearance a bit, I might wear clothes which is closer to sunnah in my, own, in, my, in my understanding, I might start going to the masjid more, I might recite a bit more Quran. Yes, alhamdulillah, they are gems of actions. They are beautiful actions, actions that will make you closer to Allah. But why do we fail to re- realize and recognize that that's not the true essence of deen? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa didn't just come to say to me and you for 23 years of prophethood that there are five pillars of Islam. Shahada, which is the kalima, announce that Allah is one. Pray five times a day. Fast in the month of Ramadan. If you are eligible to give zakat, then give zakat. If you have the means and the money and all the conditions that fall upon you to go for hajj, go for hajj once in a lifetime. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not spend 23 years giving me and you the message of these five pillars of Islam. In reality, you don't need 23 years to tell someone about five pillars. Rather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught me and you how to become a human being. How to actually be a human being who when people look at, they recognize that this is a person of Allah. This is a person who is now connected to Allah. My respected teacher yesterday, I went to visit him, Sheikh Bilal from Darul Unbari, my respected teacher of hadith. May Allah ta'ala increase him in his knowledge, in his understanding. May Allah increase him more. He was explaining a very beautiful point. This point where I mentioned to you too, that we think deen is limited to these actions, to holding a miswak, to entering the masjid with the right foot, and then when I go out of the masjid, I forget about everything else. That eating is, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim I eat with my right hand. But when I'm eating, I am disobeying Allah in other regards. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa didn't just come for these five pillars. He came for a very, very important, very, very important point. He came to enter into our hearts something called fikr, something called concern. What do I mean by this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَاغِ O Messenger of Allah, your duty, your task is, give the message. Every other Prophet before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, give the message, give the message to the people. That's it. Give the message. If they accept it, they don't accept it, no problem. Your job is only to give that message. So the message is, O people, turn to Allah, come back to Allah. Doesn't accept, that's not your responsibility anymore. So the Prophet is being told, just give the message. But despite this, the Prophet wasallam, there was something more to him. The example I'm going to give to you is, the Prophet wasallam is speaking to his companions. One companion, he's mounted on his mount, a camel. And he has loaded this camel, heavily loaded this camel. And now this camel is burdened. This camel, I'm not talking about human, I'm talking about a camel, remember, a camel. This camel looks at Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa Rasulullah looks at the camel. The camel comes closer to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa And the camel starts to complain to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa crying. O Messenger of Allah, my master, the one that mounts on me, he has overburdened me. O Messenger of Allah, I find it difficult to travel. A camel is speaking to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa not a human being. Remember this. <coughs> the camel speaks to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a messenger of Allah. I'm struggling. 
It's too much for me. The Messenger of Allah says to the Sahabi, the companion, that you are overriding and overworking this camel. Either lessen the burden and free this camel. This camel is complaining. And the Prophet of Allah, the ulama explaining this hadith, that the Prophet of Allah, he is not, he hasn't just made this statement. Rasulullah is getting deeply upset that you've, you're overburdening this camel. <coughs> Emotions are taking over now. He's speaking with emotion. That this is a camel. Why have you done this? Why, why are you overburdening this camel for? Why are you giving this camel a hard time for? Another narration wherein Rasulullah was in a gathering, one companion comes and in his jubba he's holding and the sound of little birds can be heard. And Rasulullah is in the gathering and uh, the mother bird is surrounding and she is flying over the gathering. The Messenger of Allah looks up. He says, who has given this mother distress? Who has given this mother pain? We're not talking about a human mother. We're talking about a bird. That she's flying around, she's creaking and she's screeching because her children, her two little birds, they have been taken and she's surrounding the garden. Rasulullah says, return, return the babies, return them back to the mother. Return it back to the mother bird. Rasulullah, he stopped. In the hadith, my respected teacher explains, Rasulullah is giving a bayan. He's speaking to the people, a bayan of Rasulullah. The speech of the Prophet is very important. He's speaking to the people, he's advising them, he's talking about deen. And a bird is circling the air. Bayan, everything finished. Advice to the people, finished. Stop, pause, finished. That bird is in distress. Let me sort that out before I carry on with my bayan. Prophet of Allah, everything in a pause. Who's giving this bird distress? Who's giving this bird distress? Give back. Give back the children to the mother. Then Rasulullah continued with his bayan, with his speech. Rasulullah had so much concern for animals. And me and you, our hearts are so hard that we don't even understand what it means to be kind to people. That is this what Rasulullah taught me and you know? He had a concern. The ulama explained when the Prophet of Allah used to sleep, then a sound could be heard. So in the Arabic language, it is given the explanation and the meaning that if we were to translate for everyone else and for every other situation, you would say that a snoring sound could be heard from the Prophet ﷺ when he used to sleep. But the ulama say, no, the Messenger of Allah did not snore. This was not a snoring sound. The ulama, my respected teacher, Sheikh Yusuf Mutala Sahib, Hafizahullah, says, this is not the sound of snoring coming from the Prophet ﷺ. Rather, there is a hadith of Rasul that when I sleep, my eyes may sleep, but my heart does not sleep. From this, the ulama explained that sound is not the sound of breathing and heavy breathing and the snoring effect. Rather, it is the heart of Rasul وسلم, that whilst he's sleeping, his heart is there busy in the concern for the whole of mankind. To the extent in the Quran, Allah has to say to his Rasul, that, O oh Muhammad, enough. Enough, you have been spending your complete night in worship, make it into thirds. O oh Muhammad, you need to separate your night into resting and into worship. Allah has to say to his beloved that enough, too much. You are crying too much. You are asking too much. Your job was just to give the message. That's all that was required from you. But whilst giving that message, his heart is there attached to every single human being. And the best example, this example, everyone should be aware of, the example of Ta'if. Ya Allah, what can we say about the example of Ta'if? The Prophet ﷺ is in Makkah, distressed, distressed. Why? He's calling the people, please brother, please, come back to Allah, please. Rasulullah is calling them, they are denying him. No, who are you to come up with this new religion that we have to let go of our idols? Who are you to ask us this? Who are you to say that this is you are the messenger of Allah? So Rasulullah is the asking. To the extent Rasulullah cannot ask any more from them right now. So Rasulullah knows that there is an area outside Mecca, which today still exists, the area of Taif, which is between two valleys. So it is told to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, try there, go there. So Rasulullah doesn't give up, he goes there. Now when he goes there, they've heard the news. The Muhammad, this man is claiming to be a prophet. He's claiming to be the one who is calling people towards Allah. So now he's in Taif. The chiefs, he goes to the chiefs, they reject him. Everyone rejects him. 
And while leaving Taif, the Prophet doesn't leave in, leave in peace either. The children, the women folk are told that line up. When this Muhammad is leaving Taif, what you will do, O oh children, and all oh you women folk, you will pelt him. You will pelt him with stones and we will give him that exit that he needs. So he doesn't come back here. The Messenger of Allah by himself, no one with him. No one with him. He's being pelted by stones to the extent that Rasulullah is now bleeding from head onto his toe. Rasulullah is wearing sandals, his blessed feet, because of the blood being stuck to the sole of his feet, it is sticking, because it's extensive heat there too, it is sticking to the sandal of the sandal of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa his soul and his sandals. To the extent it is mentioned on this, uh, that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa he falls unconscious a few times whilst leaving Taif. So you can imagine how hurt he is. The people of Makkah, yeah, they ignored him, but they didn't physically abuse him in this sort of way. Yes, some individuals did, but a collective group actually physically harming him, that didn't happen before. Allah is showing his Rasul, his Habib, his beloved, that this is what's going to happen to you, this is what's happening. So now you can imagine, if I was a human being, if anyone did any sort of wrong to me, or to my family member in that sort of way, I'm telling you, how hurt I would be. If someone was to not just verbally reject me, was to reject me in such a way that they are beating me, because I am calling them towards goodness. How does hard would that person become? Rasul leaves, Jibreel is, descend, is told to descend. But Allah Ta'ala says to him that when Muhammad gives you the command, whatever command it may be, you do not need to come back and consult with me. Deal with it there and there. So Jibreel is told, just come down, no need to come back to the heavens and ask me regarding whatever Muhammad has proposed, whatever he has asked. So Jibreel descends, O Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are angels called Malakul Jabal, the angels of the mountain. And they have been fixed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are two on either side of Taif. Taif is in the middle, there are two mountains. It is your command. As soon as you say, do so, then it will happen that these two angels will crush together the mountain and they will destroy the people in between. Completely destroy them. This was told to the Prophet sallallahu so now he needs to make a decision. That these people, look how much wrong they've done to me. It wasn't one or two people that rejected me. The whole tribe of Taif rejected me. They've gone far, very far. So the Prophet ﷺ, after hearing this proposal from Jibri, that I can command these two, as soon as you say do so, they will crush the people of Taif in between these two mountains. Now Rasulullah ﷺ, he turns to Allah. He needs to talk to Allah. Now listen to this dua, Ya Allah. Understand the situation and understand what kind of dua is going to be made now. Allahumma ilayka ashku. Oh Allah, I complain. Oh Allah, I complain to you. Allahumma ilayka ashku. Ilayka comes before the verb of ashku, which gives emphasis on the words that, Oh Allah, I only complain to you. Jibreel, aside, mountains aside, I'm speaking to Allah now. Allahumma ilayka ashku. Oh Allah, I complain to you. So now what is he going to complain about? That they've done me wrong, oh Allah, they've done so much wrong to me, they've done this to me, they've hurt me, they've done this. No. Allahumma ilayka ashku, du'fa kuwati. Oh Allah, I complain to you that I was weak. I complain to you that you sent me and I did not have the strength to give your message to the people. Wa killata hilati. Oh Allah, I complain to you that I didn't have the means, I didn't have the tools, I didn't know how to talk to them, I didn't know how to go to them and tell them about you. I complain for this, that I didn't know how to tell them about you. Not that they've hurt him, that they made him bleed, that he fell unconscious. I'm complaining to you that I didn't know how to talk to these people. I didn't know that, do I shower at them? Do I talk to them softly? Do I say this to them? Do I joke with them? Do I try this style or that style of speech? How do I talk? I didn't know. I complain to you that I don't have the means. Wahawani ala nas, and that the people overpowered me. You sent me with the truth and I couldn't even give the truth to them. He's crying to Allah saying that I couldn't fulfill my duty. Forget what they did to me. His concern is that I did wrong to them. And Rasulullah continues to make dua. And my respected teacher mentioned yesterday, this is a historical account, that Wallahi Azim, every Muslim of the subcontinent, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, 
Wallahi lazim, me and you are the fruits of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's dua on the journey to Taif. Why? Because Rasulullah said to Allah, Oh Allah, yeah, maybe they didn't listen to me. It's possible that their progeny, that their children will accept Islam later, Oh Allah. Let them be. Don't destroy them. It is mentioned from the people of Taif, from the people of Taif, when one became Muslim, he traveled from Mecca, from Taif, he came to India, the great India of that time. And he was the first to spread Islam to the people of India. And he is a Taifi. He is a man from the people of Taif. So if the people of Taif were destroyed, would a man from Taif come to <coughs> India and announce Islam in that great India back then? No. And wallahi lazim, me and you, if you look in our family trees, we will find that we were not Muslims. Even if we look back, probably not even 10 generations, we will come to realize that our family tree is not a clean or pure family tree of Muslims all the way. A man from Taif came. And that man is the dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Oh Allah, it's my fault, my weakness. Let them be. It's possible that their family, their progeny, their children will accept Islam. And after we find that a man from Taif comes and he does the effort of Islam in India and through that, alhamdulillah, then more Islam came to India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. And now today we're sitting in the United Kingdom, 2016. And we are Muslims and we are discussing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we are the dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But that concern of Rasulullah wasn't limited. It was a true concern. So now we need to ask ourselves, how fake am I? How fake am I actually? That I claim I love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I claim to be such a good person. I make so many claims. But why is it that when I make these claims, and everything in my life seems to be contrary to that way. You know, for example, if you claim to love your family and then you're treating your family with disrespect, you know, treating them with kindness, can a person actually say that he loves his family then? Why is it that in front of people so easily smiling, our oh, brother is sunnah to smile, sister is sunnah to smile, everyone smiling, that before you pray salah, yeah, I use the miswak, yeah, it's sunnah to do this, yeah, it's sunnah to do that. But as soon as I'm at home, the sunnah of greeting your family. The Rasulullah would walk into his house and say to his wife, to his children, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Where's that sunnah? The sunnah outside, yeah, it's so good to be wearing the tube to masjid. You should be going and wearing the thob and you should be wearing uh, topi, amama. Yeah, it's so cool, it's good. And at home, the sunnah of feeding your wife with your hands. No, that's not a sunnah anymore. The sunnah that Hey, Rasulullah's life is all about sunnah. He went to the masjid. He prayed salah. Rasulullah didn't pray 50 rakats of salah. The way we have five rakats of salah today, Rasulullah also had that same five compulsory salah. Rasulullah went to the masjid for salah. Yes. What about the rest of his 22 hours of his whole day? How long does salah take? Was Rasulullah only in the masjid praying salah? No. And you know who is the best evidence for us? When your family members can say that, yes. My husband, my brother, he is a true man. He is a good person. Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was a husband. He was a man of his word. He used to be in the house and he used to be there making his own food. Can we even imagine that when you think of a teacher, a sheikh, that you're thinking, oh, when he goes home, you know, he must have his family there, people cooking for him, people doing this for him, people buying this for him. The Messenger of Allah, the Sheikh of all of Sheikhs, Sheikh al Shuyukh, the greatest of all of Sheikhs. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his wife says that yes, my Rasul, my beloved sallallahu alayhi wa used to enter the house, but when he used to enter, sometimes he would be busy fixing the lace on his shoes, sometimes he would be busy fixing the patches on his clothes, sometimes he would be busy making the food. This is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Has Aisha radiallahu ta'ala mentioned the incident when me and my Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we were outside walking. Rasulullah said to me, the Aisha, let's go for a run. Let's go for a run. Let's see who is faster. Has Aisha radiallahu ta'ala says we had a sprint in the darkness of the night and after sprinting, I won the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I beat him. So Rasulullah was smiling. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala says a few days later, the messenger of Allah woke me from my sleep and he said to me, the Aisha, let's go for a run today too. 
Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and says, that day and at that time, I became more heavy. I became more heavy and now Rasulullah says, let's go for a run. And I go for a, we went for a run, for a sprint. And this time Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam beat me. That was his relationship. That was his life. When we say that, oh guys, it's sunnah to smile. Yeah, it's not sunnah to smile just at your friends. It's also sunnah to smile at your family members. It's also sunnah to smile at everyone. You know, we talk about so many, so we select what we think is sunnah. And then we portray that we are lovers of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa You see, the downfall of Islam and people frowning upon Islam, there is a cure for it. That cure is the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in every way. You know, we, we, we talk about the sunnah of you know, eating. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he talks about sunnah too. The Messenger of Allah said that when you cook, so Rasulullah says to his companions that when you cook, increase the salam, increase the curry in that, so that you may give it to your neighbor. The Messenger of Allah, in his house it is mentioned that many a times there wasn't food. And when there is food, he is giving the command that, okay, now we've got some food, increase it. We're in need, but hey, forget us, we're going to give some to our neighbor. Once, a great sheikh was asked, the sheikh, was it sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu to have something sweet before a meal or after a meal? So when he was asked this, the sheikh started to cry. Profusely, crying, 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 crying. So the people asked him, what the hell, what is he crying for? We just asked him, is it sunnah to eat sweet dish before the main meal or after the main meal? What is he crying for? He was crying uncontrollably, he's crying, crying, they're waiting. Someone like saying, why did we ask him? How have we upset him? Why is the sheikh crying? When the sheikh gathered himself, he said, my brothers, you're asking, did Rasulullah, is it sunnah to have sweet dish before or after? Have you not seen that great portion of his life where he had nothing to eat? Where he says in Sahih Bukhari, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and says, months would pass by and we would have nothing in our house. Nothing in our home. The, the stove was dry for months on end. Have you forgotten that part of his life? That we look at those things that look pretty to me and you. That hey, this is cool sunnah, let's just do it. And our understanding of sunnah is very limited too. Akhla, character, is what takes a person very far. Very far. So our effort, Wallahi lazim, if we make effort on ourselves in that respect, automatically everything else falls in line. Why? That you're making effort to become a better person. Becoming a better person means praying your salah on time. Automatically that comes into your life. You're making an effort to speak to your brothers, to speak to your family members. Automatically. Let me give you one example where we think that, oh, I speak to my family, they don't listen, they don't know what religion is, you know, how am I going to tell them? One incident of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, three separate ahadith mentioned about one man. A man from the village, Arabi. So when a person comes from the village, they come to Medina, they don't know the etiquettes of city life. They don't know certain etiquettes. So this companion, he became a sahabi because he saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He came to the messenger of Allah. And the three different incidents, same man. He says to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O messenger of Allah, when is the day of judgment? First time probably he's meeting Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jumps to the question, when is the day of judgment? No, tell me, when is the day of judgment? So Rasulullah seeing that this person, okay, He's a bit you know, strict, he's a bit hard the way he's speaking. Rasulullah says, why have you prepared for the day of judgment? So the person says, he's a Muslim, he's become a new Muslim. Not much, but I can say one thing to you. I love Allah and I love his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I have that much inside me. So Messenger of Allah said to him, Al-Maru ma'aman ahabba, a person will be with whom he loves. Or the other companions heard this, they're like, yeah. They said, Wallahi lazim. Anas bin Malik says, Wallahi lazim. We the companions were not happier than any day but that day when Rasulullah said, You will be with whom you love. Because we the companions, we love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa We knew now that we will be with him in Jannah. We will be with him in the hereafter. The same man now, Rasulullah is in the masjid, gathering. Hafiz ibn Hajr al-Asqalani, the great commandant of Sahih Bukhari says, Same man, Rasulullah is in a gathering in the masjid. This man is at the back. He comes in, 
seeing the Rasulullah and his companions sitting down. And he doesn't understand the etiquette of the masjid. First time he's going to Medina, he starts to urinate in the back of the masjid, inside the sanctuary of the masjid. He starts to urinate. Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala, angry. What's he doing? What's he doing? It's the house of Allah. I can't even dare to imagine anyone coming and urinating the masjid. Rasulullah, look at what Rasulullah says. No, leave him be. He started, let him be. If he stops now, he's going to get hurt. It's going to affect his body. Rasulullah is not thinking about the masjid right now. He's thinking about that if he stops and if you stop him out of fright, out of fear, it's going to hurt him. It's going to be a means of hurt for his stomach. Because he is urinating, let him be, let him finish. How can you stop him now? Scientists say too that if a person is you know, relieving himself and you give him a fright at that moment, it shocks the bowel. It shocks the system. Rasulullah is saying, leave him be. No, no. And that man's listening to all this. He relieves himself. Rasulullah calls him. That this is the house of Allah. This is the house of Allah. And it's not right that we make the house of Allah impure. That this is not the way it should be. And I forgot to mention when he asked the Rasul that when is the day of Qiyamah, I forgot to mention the crucial part. When he asked him when is the day of Qiyamah, he didn't just ask. He started to tug at the jubba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa On the clothes of Rasulullah, he was tugging, tugging. To the extent the Sahaba say, we saw the mark. That when you tugging onto the clothes, we could see the red mark appearing onto the blessed neck of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That's how hard he was tugging, trying to get the attention of Rasulullah. The when is the day, day of judgment? When is the day of judgment? And when Rasulullah turns around, no anger, nothing on his face. And Rasulullah says, that, what have you prepared for the day of judgment? So now after he, he has relieved himself, Rasulullah says, that, no, this is the house of Allah. This should not be the case. Salah time comes in that very same day. Now Rasulullah is leading Salah. Rasulullah leads Salah and this uh, companion, this village that has come, now that he's seen Rasulullah, how Rasulullah is with him, he's realized that, look, I took to him, he still answered, I urinated inside the masjid, he still spoke to me this way. He's in love with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In his namaz, whilst Rasulullah is leading in his salah, he says, Allahumma li wa Muhammad faqat. O oh Allah, only forgive me and only forgive Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said it out loud. So Rasulullah, after the salah finishes, Rasulullah says, who, who made this comment? That Allah only forgive uh, uh, me and Muhammad. So it's that same, that same villager. I did a messenger of Allah. I made this comment. He is in love with Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah calls him. Why have you narrowed down the mercy of Allah? The mercy of Allah is not only for you and Muhammad. The mercy of Allah is for everyone. So Rasulullah smilingly says to him, the mercy of Allah is for everyone. Why have you only limited to me and you? And then when this person left, Rasul, he asked Rasulullah, he's going back to his village now. What do I do? Tell me my advice is. So Rasulullah says to him, Offer your salah on time. If zakat comes upon you, give your zakat. If hajj ever comes upon you, fulfill your hajj. Fast in the month of Ramadan. Lead a good life. That's all Rasulullah said. That person said, Wallahi lazim, till the day I die, nor will I increase, nor will I decrease from what you have said to me. I will act upon this. Rasulullah said to his companions, If you want to see a man of Jannah, then he is a man of Jannah. That's it. Life changed, gone. But look at the approach of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa He gave that time, he made the effort with them. He made the effort. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa his concern for everyone, every single person, was this. He's the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa He used to be hadith. Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala narrates. The ones we with the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa All of a sudden, the messenger of Allah says, I miss my brothers. I miss my brothers. The companions say, Are we not your brothers? Oh, Messenger of Allah, we're here. We're your brothers. What do you mean you miss your brothers? We're in front of you. Rasulullah said, La, Antum Ashabi, you are my companions. You're next to me, you're with me. I miss those people, my brothers, that they will come after me. They will come after you. And they will come and they will. Sac- they will want to sacrifice everything in their life, every benefit, every blessing, 
just so that they can see me once. They'll be willing to do this. They will believe in me with the firmness. They will love me. They will believe in me. They will long to meet me. And if the chance was ever to come, they would sacrifice everything just so they can meet me. I miss them, brothers of mine. So Rasulullah is talking about all those people that came after him. That those that have that love and desire to meet their Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it doesn't end there. Final hadith for today, final hadith for today. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yes, in his lifetime, he had so much concern, so much for the believers. But let's just understand the pinnacle of this concern then. It is mentioned by Abu Huraira radiyallahu ta'ala anhu in the final chapter of Sahih Bukhari in Kitab al-Tawheed wherein Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned very lengthy hadith that on the day of Qiyamah people will be gathered on the platform in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala people will be panicking people will be in distress that I am standing in the court of Allah standing in Allah's court people will run towards their prophets the people of Adam will go towards Adam the Adam please 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 become a means of our intercession. Do something, say something to Allah so He can forgive us. Adam alayhi salam, Ya Rabbi, nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. I myself, I am fearful today. Allah can ask me about my, my errors. Allah can ask me about me. I am too fearful today. I cannot help you. People will run towards Nuh alayhi salam that you are the messenger of Allah. You are the one that Allah accepted your dua so fast. After 950 years of calling people, you made one dua and Allah eliminated the world. Ya Rabbi, nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. I today, I'm in a difficult situation. Allah's anger, Allah's wrath is such. I don't know what to say in the court of Allah. How can I help anyone? Prophet after prophet after prophet. People will go to Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. You are the messenger of Allah. You are that messenger of Allah that Allah created you without the means of a father. Isa alayhi salam, nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. Today I am scared. Allah, if he asks me that, why did they take you as a son after you left the face of this earth when you were risen to the heavens? Why did they take you as a son of mine? If Allah asks me regarding these things, what can I answer to Allah? For my people that went astray. So Isa alayhi salam says, go to Ahmad. Go to who? Ahmad. That is the name of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. The people will go to Rasul sallallahu alayhi sallam or Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam. Everyone has been saying nafsi, 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 nafsi. Hadith of Sahih Bukhari. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi says that I will say on that day, Ya Rabbi Ummati, Ya Rabbi Ummati, Ya Rabbi Ummati. Oh my Allah, my people, oh my Allah, my people, oh my Allah, my people. Rasulullah will fall into sajida. Rasulullah himself says, on that day I will praise Allah with such words that no one before me has praised Allah with these words. I will praise him. Allah will say, Ya Muhammad, irfa ra'sak. O Muhammad, lift your head. Sal ma shi'ta. Ask whatever you want. You will be granted whatever you ask. So now Allah is so happy. is about to accept the dua of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa What do you want? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says to Allah, Ya Rabbi, ummati. Ya Rabbi, ummati. Ya Rabbi, ummati. Oh my Allah, my people, my people, my people. That's all I ask of Allah. Allah says, I swear by my honor that those that have iman in their hearts, I give them Jannah. Rasulullah, second time, Sajida, praises Allah with those words and no one has praised him. This happens four times as mentioned in this hadith. On the fourth time, Rasulullah raises his head. Allah says, ask whatever you want. Fourth time, and in between Allah said, I have forgiven such and such a people. Those that have iman in their heart, I have forgiven them. Those that have a spark of iman, that in their lifetime after everything, they just about believed in Allah. I have forgiven them. They can go to Jannah. On the fourth time when Rasulullah will go to Sajjah and then ask Allah, again Rasulullah will say, Ya Rabbi Ummati, Ya Rabbi Ummati, Ya Rabbi Ummati. Oh my Allah, my people, oh my Allah, my people, oh my Allah, my people. Then Allah Ta'ala will say, that those that have an iota, dharra, 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 dharra. It is mentioned in the hadith, dharra, dharra. Not even an iota, smaller than an iota. A speck. Whatever word can describe a dot, whatever word can describe an iota. A speck of iman. Just just an iota of iman. Just just the littleness of iman. 
Those that have done and that are burning the fire of Jahannam because of the dua and the asking of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Allah says, I swear by my honor. I swear by my might, I also forgive every single one of them and they can also go to Jannah. Rasulullah is doing this for me and you. But at the same time, don't, don't leave with a misconception that oh, Rasulullah will make dua for me and hey, everything's going to be okay. That very same Rasul on the day of Qiyamah, before this, when he will be uh, placed in front of the Hawza Kawthar, the fountain, and he'll be giving that such a drink, which is more whiter than milk, sweeter than honey, and he'll be presenting it to his ummah. It is mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu on that day, people will come towards me. There will be some that will be coming towards me. I will be ready. I am there giving, just about to pass a goblet of this drink. I'm just about to pass it. Just about. And an angel will say, Ya Muhammad, no. He's not deserving of this. Rasulullah is my ummati. He's from, he believed in me. He's an ummati. The angel will say to Rasulullah, yes, but after you, after you left, he did not stay in your way. He didn't see the need to follow what you left behind. So Rasulullah himself will turn away from the person. May Allah protect us from that day when Rasulullah will turn away from such people. May we not be amongst them people. May we be amongst those people that Rasulullah will give towards. For that, Wallahi Lazim, I'm not gonna sweeten it, I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm not gonna sit here and make myself feel guilty. Wallahi Lazim, we need to change our ways. There is no other way for me to say it. I need to change my ways. I don't know about you, I know I need to change my ways. And I'm not even sitting here, and I'm not even going to pretend and make myself sound humble. It's not an act. Wallahi Lazim, I know about my own life, about my own wrongs, and I know I need to make a change. And you all know for your own lives that a change has to be made. And it's not such a change that, hey, I'm going to leave here, I'm going to pray Maghrib, I'm going to pray Isha, and everything's good. No one is saying that you can't laugh. No one is saying you can't have a good time. The request is, do everything but with, between those boundaries that have been set by Allah and His Rasul Wasallam. Let's actually change our lives, man. Let's actually change our lives. We actually turn to Allah. And you know where it starts from? The fact that a person can drop a tear. The fact that emotions are building and you're feeling that, Wallah, I actually need to change. I actually need to make. People think I'm such a pious person. People think I'm a hafiz. People think I'm this. People think I'm a good person. Hey, because I go masjid for salah. They don't know the rest of my life. They don't know what I get up to. Isn't it time that the way we can be so fake isn't it better to be true to Allah in every situation, public life, private life, wherever we are? That before we sleep, we turn back to Allah in repentance. Oh Allah, I've done so many wrongs today. Forgive me. Shouldn't this effort be made every single day of our lives? Ramadan, no Ramadan. Why should it make a difference to us? It should be that we are trying all the way throughout life. And no, no one's an angel. No one's perfect. We are going to make mistakes. We are going to forget. It happens. You are going to slip here and there. But that's not called slipping. Slipping is when you've fallen and you never get back up. When a person slips and he puts out his hands of repentance, that I'm not going to fall flat on my face. I'm going to stand up again. That's when a person will be with Allah. Hazrat Hakim Akhtar Sab Rahmatullah a great saint who passed away in the last two, three years, very beautifully says, Yek rishta hai jo sobar thore, sobar jore. That that person who breaks this connection with Allah 100 times, he always makes the effort to reconnect with Allah hundred times. That every time I turn away from Allah and I realize that I did a wrong, man. Why did I sin for? Why did I do that wrong? And that regret comes in your heart and in your mind. Oh Allah, please forgive me. I won't do it again. Allah knows that that seven is possible. You do it again. But be sincere and see how Allah Taala will work with you to a point where this effort is made. That I don't want to sin. I don't want to sin. That it becomes you feel embarrassed to sin. How can I sin when I know Allah is watching me now? How can I carry on sinning? How can I be so fake that I sit here giving a hadith class and in the darkness of the night or in my house or wherever I am, I'm disobeying Allah? How can I be so fake? That embarrassment takes over. And then you become forced not to disobey Allah. And there is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, when my servant, he <coughs> makes effort he does the faraiz, he becomes closer to me, closer to me. He does the nawafil, optional praise, he becomes closer to me, closer to me. I become his tongue from which he speaks. Meaning, Allah makes it so that it's too difficult to say anything wrong with your tongue. I become his hands with which he holds. 
I, he will only hold good things. I become his legs with which he walks, that he only walks towards goodness. I become his mind, his heart, that he only thinks of goodness. That is the stage that can be reached. And wallah, every single person, you don't have to be Hafiz, you don't have to be Sheikh, you don't have to be anyone, <laughs> Sheikh this, Ustad that, and Hafiz this, and student this, and that. No, that is not the condition to become a friend of Allah. That's not the condition to become close to Allah. There's only one condition. Repent, turn back to Allah, and you make an effort to please Allah. That's the condition to become the friend of Allah. It's possible Ustad Sab is there going down and downhill, 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 and a such a so-called, so-called layman, that we don't even class to be anything good in society. He has no platform, he has no stage, he has no name, nothing. He's just Abdullah, he's just Abdul Rahman. But he's been making that effort to become closer to Allah. Wallahi lazim, the sight of Allah, he is ten times better than that person who has not made effort to become Allah's. And only on the Day of Judgment we'll realize exactly who is worthy of praise on the Day of Judgment. So we just need to make our effort. Allah allows us to be amongst those people that strive to please Allah. Allah makes us amongst those people that we recognize our faults, we recognize our wrongs, we become busy trying to fix our lives. We become so busy that it's too hard to see the faults in others. That I just become focused on trying to make my life a bit better. And as I'm trying to make myself a bit better, I'm going to hold the hand of a friend. I'm going to hold the hand of my wife. I'm going to hold the hand of my children. I'm going to hold the hand of my siblings. And slowly, slowly, slowly help them to get up. Slowly, slowly, slowly help them to continue to try to please Allah. It doesn't, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen overnight. The effort, and what's the greatest effort? It's not this tongue. It's the actions. If I change my approach when I go home, automatically things get better. You go home and you give salam, automatically you've already melted the heart of your family members by giving salam. You don't have to say to someone, the hey, namaz for, pray salah, now. You don't have to say it. Show it. You show it. What it means to pray salah. Oh, you know, you, you don't do this, you don't do that. Okay? He or she doesn't do this, doesn't do that. At least you do it for now and then see what happens. You become steadfast on that and see what happens. May Allah accept us all. Allah allows all to be sincere. Allah allows us so that we truly, with sincerity, with a true understanding, we become people that strive to become like Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That we learn about those sunnah that we're neglecting. And you know what them sunnah, the umbrella of them sunnah is how to be just a good, simple person. How to be just a good person. And I'm not trying to in any way, please don't take the wrong message, that I'm trying to astaghfirullah in any sort of way say that salah and the sunnah of eating and the sunnah of entering the masjid and these sunnah are not important. Astaghfirullah, no. My point is that they are important, but more so as a Muslim, as a human being that's trying to be a good Muslim, trying to be a good person, I need to work on my character, I need to work on my way with people. I need to look into them sunnah of how to approach people, how to smile. We need to learn actually how to smile. To the extent we might, even, we might even need to stand in front of the mirror just to see what it means to smile. Just to know, do you smile this way or do you smile that way? We need to learn this. <coughs> Allah allows to become amongst those people. May Allah ta'ala accept. Allah allows so that whoever, whilst listening, those online, those listening in front of me, if Allah has allowed a spark of regret, repentance to come inside our hearts. Allah allows us to use that blessing of regret, repentance to actually turn to Allah. Always remember that the ability of regret to feel shy, shameful of your actions, of your connection with Allah, that in itself is a great blessing of Allah. Allah allows us to use it well. Allah makes us amongst those people that please Allah. Allah allows us so that whenever we slip, we learn to turn back to Allah. Inshallah, Imam Bukhari, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, Next week we'll explain to us that when we're beginning letters, what is the way of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We will, inshallah, discuss other matters. And slowly, slowly, as approximately, we've only got 200 ahadith left from Al-Adab al-Mufrad. Allah allows us so that with istiqamat, with acceptance, Allah allows us to continue to go through it. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanallah al-adhim, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi, wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-alihi al-hazim.